There we go. Welcome to episode, what's the number again? 133, where we'll have some fun with Java Flight Recorder. And uh, talking about recording things, uh, we have a Quarkus 3.2 CR1 out this week or last week. Uh, one of the features we actually have in there is what we call the built user uh, built users analytics. So this is uh, one of, like we've always wanted to know like when people develop on Quarkus, what JDK, what Java, what GraalVM, what Maven Gradle version are they using, and how often are they using it, kind of thing. Um, so now there's an option when you start dev mode, you can say, "Hey, I would like to share that information." It's all anonymous. Or if you say no, then you nothing will be shared. Um, but that, that should be available in 3.2 CR1. Uh, it's there now. We see the data already coming in, which is awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you install 3.2, well, let us know how it goes. Uh, but do say yes and help us to kind of see, OK, is this mostly Mac people, or is Windows people, or is it some other kind of Linux, um, that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, that's out uh, this week. So we good. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, we have uh, Robert and Andrew on here to talk about JFR, which is what is it? JDK flight recorder or Java flight recorder? What what do we call it? We're going to be calling it JDK flight recorder if we can. Remember. JDK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but let's start with you guys, Robert. Where are you from, and yeah, what do you do? Uh, well, I am on the Java monitoring team at Red Hat, and I primarily work on uh, for LVM native images, specifically JFR and native images. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today and uh, what stuff you can do with it. Awesome. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, uh, I'm Andrew. I'm also on the Java monitoring team at Red Hat um, from around the Toronto area. Robert is as well. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and I primarily work on Cryostat, which is, uh, we call it like a container. Um, container native application for for JFR, so it's kind of a bridge between um, you and JFR and your applications, and helps kind of smooth out the workflow of using JFR, um, make it a little bit more friendly. No, no. Excellent, and uh, yeah, and anyone who's listening on, you can just ask a question, and then we, we'll try and fit it in. Um, yeah, Robert and Andrew is is yeah, you heard like JDK. Masters, and I, I'm a Quarkus novice. So anything about JDK and Quarkus questions goes today, I think. We'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, so anyway, well, let's let's move on. So what what is what is JFR, Java, JDK, Flight Recorder, whatever we want to call it? OK, well, what do you want I to share? actually got a, a slide for that. Yeah, my slides oh, are visible, yes. right? OK. Um, there we go. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, today's topics, like uh, Andrew and I mentioned, JFR uh, in native mode for, with your native Quarkus apps, and also uh, Andrew's going to talk about CrowdStack. So yeah, a refresher, um, as Max was alluding to. So what is JDK Flight Recorder, aka JFR? So um, <clears throat> JFR basically provides a lightweight and unobtrusive monitoring solution for applications. And the I guess the key thing about it is that it's built directly into the JVM. So it ships with OpenJDK. Um, and it's uh, easily accessible, and it's, a, uh, it's an event-driven platform. So the data is wrapped up into well-defined, I guess, chunks called events, and they'll contain data on like uh, GC information, on uh, lock acquisitions, on thread threads, for example, um, all sorts of things that you might find useful to monitor. Um, another thing that's important to mention is that it is uh, designed to minimize overhead. And um, the reason that's important is because you can use it in um, uh, monitoring in production. So yeah, I guess the key uses are for profiling, monitoring, and um, some use cases for debugging as well. OK. Um, I actually have a couple more slides that just to complete the refresher. So um, yeah, this is just a screenshot of Java Mission Control, which is, I guess, um, a frequently used uh, application where you can kind of like inspect your uh, JFR flight recordings. So here's just an example of looking at some event data. You can see that there's stack traces. There's things like when the event was emitted, the start time, duration, 
what thread was emitting it, stuff like that, things that you might find useful. And you can view things such as like uh, memory usage as well, profile where object allocations, object allocations are happening. So yeah, that's just oh. a, I guess a refresher and check. Oh. What was the tool you show here? It's a little bit blurred. I can't see the name of it. Oh, yeah. I guess the screenshot's kind of small, but it's called a, a Java Mesh Control, also known as JMC. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just a tool that you can use, um, or at least that I use pretty frequently to uh, view uh, JFR flight recordings in a it's convenient way. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> so what, yeah. what's special about JFR? Uh, yeah, so JFR, I guess the main things are that it's uh, designed to have very minimal overhead. I think the figure that's often quoted is like under 2%. <clears throat> and it's built directly into the JVM, so it's very easily accessible. It ships with OpenJDK. Um, if you're running Java, you most likely have access to JFR. You don't have to have anything special in order to use it. Um, yeah, so I guess those are the two key things. Um, I say it ships to OpenJDK, but also now you can use it with uh, Graal VM native images as well. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as well in the, I guess, the next few slides. Yeah, so uh, I've only got a couple more slides just to kind of like get some of the informative points out of the way. But um, yeah, as I mentioned um, a few seconds ago, can you use JFR in native mode? And uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, one complaint uh, often about uh, I guess Quarkus native mode applications is that they can be hard to observe from the Java mode counterparts. Um, but recently in Graal VM, uh, there have been quite a few big improvements to um, to uh, JFR in native mode. So you can use it. Uh, it's very functional now. And although there are some limitations and some events may not be applicable, such as like anything to do with like uh, class loading or dynamic comp compilation, um, because it's ahead of time compiled. So those may not be applicable, but things such as uh, monitor usage, locks, threads, GC, um, save points, um, all that good stuff to do with VM inspection is uh, now supported. So you can do quite a few uh, useful things with it. Yeah, so I guess the ultimate goal is to try and achieve parity with Hotspot. Um, yeah, I think we're getting some questions in the chat. Oh, that's you, Max. Okay. Yeah, it's just there was uh, Jonathan was asking. Um, he says there's a lot of lot of GitHub discussions not answered. I assume you're first to Quarkus GitHub discussions. Um, if Quarkus bot does not know the keyword and tags it, yeah. So we get a ton of questions, um, and one of the reasons I moved to GitHub, um, GitHub was actually to be able to get notifications because I, don't, I forgot the number we had last time, but it's like way more than we have people or hands or even like both in Red Hat or outside Red Hat to answer these questions. Um, so we use GitHub discussions to kind of tag, to be able to automatically tag things. Um, and uh, yeah, apparently we are missing some. So as a reply to Jonathan, like we get so many questions, the best thing we can do is help uh, uh, so just other people to help answering. Uh, but if there are things that doesn't get tagged, that should be tagged, you know, let ping me, and we'll you can update the rules for the for the for the automatic tagging to to get it better. So yeah, and and yes, he also offer if I have a bird. Yes, I have a bird that tend to be silent, but apparently doesn't want to be silent today. So uh, I'll try and mute while that happens. Max, but is yeah. it a budgie? I used to have budgies. Uh, uh, was it like small pair? Like the I forgot. A parakeet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Per uh, not, well, not I recognize the sound. Yeah. They're small and colorful, so yeah. Anyway, you sorry, can't... back to JFR. Uh, go, go ahead with JFR in native mode. Right, yes. yeah. Um, uh, where was I? Yeah, so yeah, can you use JFR in Quarkus native mode? Short answer is yes, now you can. Um, so why would you even care about native mode JFR when you can use Java mode? So why not just like, if you need to use JFR uh, to test your applications out, run it in Java mode, and then convert to native mode? So I guess the main reason, one main reason for that is that what if you need to use native mode for production? So then you want to use JFR for monitoring. So you basically have no other choice than to use native mode JFR if you want to use JFR at all. So that's one reason. Another reason that's quite a big reason is that the runtime components um, in Java versus native mode are very different. So in Java mode, you have hotspot. 
as the providing all the runtime components. And in uh, a native image, you have substrate VM. So that's going to affect things such as how threads work, how concurrency works, um, how um, garbage collection works. So um, all these things will have, uh, I guess, like uh, implications for how your uh, Quarkus app runs. So if you want um, to monitor with uh, J4 and Java mode, you're not really going to get an accurate picture when you uh, run your application um, natively. So I guess that's the I, reason why you, yeah. Well, I, I, maybe you want to touch on because this is something uh, like I, I had a few times like, why wasn't J4 not just there by default if it's part of JDK? Why, why was it not there? What, what does makes it so special that it's not in J, uh, in, in native or GraalVM from from the start? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So <clears throat> the reason is that um, when you're running native mode, uh, you're not running with hotspot. So there's uh, no uh, components from hotspot at all uh, running your application. Um, what happens when your application gets compiled ahead of time to a native executable is that um, the run com runtime components are kind of like bundled in with your application code into the final binary. And those runtime components we call a substrate VM. That's just the name for it. And they're completely built from scratch um, in Java. There's no C++ code at all. So basically, none of that JFR uh, uh, infrastructure that was built into Hotspot can be carried over because it's, it's just not there. It's something completely new. Um, and so we had to re-implement JFR for Substrate VM uh, so that it can be bundled in with your application code into the final native binary. So yeah, that's, that's the reason yeah. why. Yeah. yeah, so when you say viewpoint JFR, it's because the, the the normal JFR in the JK is part of Hotspot's code, right? So every place where code gets called, there's a little call to JFR saying, hey, record that this thing happened. And That's it. Well, you, and in that image, though, there was just no, never a call to JFR, right? That's exactly. The, the thing, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's not to just to make sure. I, I, this actually, I, I think I know how this works, but tell, I might be wrong because it's not like you had to re-implement JFR. It's the actual hooks, like the the and my bird's going crazy. Uh, it's all the different hooks to call to the machinery that keeps track of JFR events. Is that true? Uh, no, it's or actually the, the whole thing. So um, all of the handling of the in-memory buffers, all the flushing infrastructure, basically almost every every part of JFR had to be re-implemented. It's not just the hooks. Um, yeah, all right. it's like the whole thing. Well, it, it, even more impressive we have it then. So there we go. Yeah. Awesome. Like I said, it is limited in some ways, but the goal is to achieve parity with, with what's available in Hotspot. Yeah, and I remember because when we started, uh, you know, Quarkus, and this was one of the big things, like, why would we use native image? Because we can't monitor it. And people point to, to JFR and, and and debugging. So, uh, mm, like, yeah. monitoring and debugging was the big two. And those are the two that we, we kind of, we as in Red Hat OpenDK team, attacked uh, and got, uh, you know, contributed to, to the GraalVM community, which is now there. Because some of the stuff they had in the enterprise version, I, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, we worked with them and said, "Hey, you want to contribute this uh, open source?" And they, you know, granted us the, the uh, you know, uh, we worked with them to get a PR in and, and get and port the thing over. And uh, they, I think they then open source part of theirs, and then we kind of merged efforts. Is that how it went down? I think so. Yeah, it was a collaboration, at least for JFR. Yeah. It was a collaboration with Oracle to get all this stuff working. Um, yeah, because yeah. they're, I guess, the the uh, maintainers of uh, GraalVM, and they're the experts on um, on that stuff. But yeah, you're also right about the yeah. debug yeah. Um, info. So now you can also debug your applications using GDB as you would with a, uh, any other, I guess, uh, native application with, built using C++, for example. So that's another step yeah. in, a, in the monitoring direction. In debugging direction. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, you go? yeah. Um, just a couple more slides to get through before you jump into a demo. But, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> so the support in uh, uh, Mandrill 22.3, which is uh, the official, uh, I guess, um, version of GraalVM that you're going to be using for Red Hat Build of Quarkus, 
um, has the following features. So you can do um, basic operations such as starting and stopping recording. Um, you're going to have several events. Um, maybe I'll have to, I don't know if you can see this. I may have to switch my screen share because uh, I have a list of events here that I will show you. Yeah, so I recently published a, a blog highlighting some of the updates for JFR. And part of it is basically just, um, I guess, a list of events uh, depending on what GraalVM version you're using. So for Mandrel 22.3, you have all these events that are supported. Um, so some pretty important things, such as things to do with monitors, um, <clears throat> GC, uh, various JFR specific things, um, some threat events. Um, yeah, so that's what you're going to have available in Mandrel 22.3. Yeah, so I get so one of the things, uh, well, two things. So first of all, I know this blog that we have a, I'm not sure if you published already, but I know you wrote a blog for the Quarkus, Quarkus IO blog that points to these two. So we will have that uh, live soon. But yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then the the um, uh, what's it called? These events when I look at them, right? The the because for me, JFR has been two parts, like in JDK. One is the OS level stuff, like oh, like yeah. threads and GOPS collection and stuff. And then there was also other high level events you could do. Uh, right. But that was more about like class loading and other things. But all those things doesn't exist in native image. Um, that's right, yeah. And that's why when you look here, you just see, well, just, it's not just adjust, but you, the, the events <coughs> that you have available are the stuff more low level, like uh, threat, threat creation and memory usage, right? Yeah, that's, that's a really good observation. And that's, that's yeah, that is one of the reasons. So some events, like you mentioned, like class loading, uh, compilation are not going to be applicable for native image. But um, some events, other events that are high level, like uh, network events, like socket IO, um, things like file IO, uh, exceptions, those are still applicable, but those haven't been implemented yet. But that's something that we're actively working on because um, okay. those events rely on bytecode instrumentation. So we have to shoehorn that instrumentation into build time um, instead of runtime. So that's something that still is in, in the works, but definitely on the road. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. OK, uh, let me switch my screen share back to the slides. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, while you do that, because remind me, but one of the things I like with JFR, which is is you can do a ton of weird stuff with it. Um, but I guess for, and that, that was actually about monitoring files, like you, you can track you know, unclosed sockets or unclosed files or which part of code is touching this kind of thing without having to change everything. Mm -hmm. But I guess what you're saying is for now, that's not possible in an image, but that is coming. The... Basically, yeah. So all that high level yeah. stuff that is um, available through bytecode instrumentation in, I guess, like OpenJDK, um, yes, that's on the roadmap. But right now, um, things like socket IO, file IO um, is not yet available. But all the but most of the low level stuff, um, okay. we've kind of prioritized, so that's why that's there on that list. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, gotcha. One last slide before we get into the demo. So this is uh, support in the latest version of GraalVM and Mandrel. So Mandrel twenty three and uh, GraalVM for uh, JDK seventeen slash JDK twenty. So a lot of really big improvements have happened within the past year. So now you can have access to stack traces uh, for your JFR events that enables things like method profiling. You can generate flame graphs, see where your application is spending time. Um, <clears throat> there's event streaming, which allows for a lot greater flexibility in how you control uh, and um, I guess like uh, operate your JFR recordings. So you can change what events are being monitored, the frequency um, of when you're recording events, uh, change other various JFR settings like on the fly based on what events you're actually seeing in your stream. So that's a lot, uh, allows for a lot more flexibility. Also, um, right now there's experimental support for remote JMX. So that'll allow for things like connection to Flight Recorder MX Bean. So um, you can do things like through GMC, you can actually connect to a running uh, native image and start a flight recording that way instead of having to start it at the time when you actually uh, start your application on the command line. So that's um, a convenient thing as well. And several new events as well to do with Excellent. threads, monitors, containers, and allocations. So a whole bunch of new stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, on the roadmap, like I mentioned, uh, high level high level events. Um, 
event throttling is also in the works and uh, Red Hat's also helping to contribute for leak profiling. So that's on the roadmap. And now I'm gonna jump into a quick demo, but um, yeah, if there's, I guess, any questions, I can answer them now before I, I guess, break to the, uh, to the terminal. Not, none yet, not, none yet, but I, I, I hope that those who listen will ask questions, but I don't, I'll, I'll make up some, it's good, just go ahead. Okay, Max. Um, yeah, so in this demo, I'm gonna show you how you can build and run with JFR uh, for your Quarkus applications. <clears throat> and walk through some events you can use. And I'm also gonna um, highlight some differences between um, a Quarkus native app in Java mode and native mode observed by JFR. So we're gonna use JFR to kind of like highlight some differences that, I, that you can see. Um, and uh, yeah, for this one, I'm gonna share my terminal. Uh, let's see, entire screen. Okay, let me know when it is uh, visible. Can you guys see my terminal? Yep, I see it. Oh, yes, sorry, yes, uh, there, there, there. Okay, uh, awesome. Yeah, so as you can see, our working directory is the Hibernate OR on Quick Start. So this is just stock. It's exactly as you would find on the Quarkus Quick Starts uh, project. So I haven't really done anything to it. <clears throat> you can see my GraalVM home is the latest version of Mandrill. So Mandrill, um, I forgot to mention, is like the downstream distribution of uh, GraalVM and it, takes out all the polyglot um, and other things that are not native image and basically just keeps the native image component. So it's kind of like a pared down uh, uh, version or downstream version of, uh, of upstream um, GraalVM CE. Um, you can see my Java home is just OpenJDK uh, 17. And yeah, so that's basically the setup for this. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna build our Quarkus uh, native application I've actually already built it to save time, but I'll show you the command that I use. So, uh, uh, dash D native to say that we're native. Uh, and this is what you need to add to build the JFR. So, quarkus.native.monitoring, and then you uh, add the JFR tag here. So, you can add other things as well, such as JVM stat, uh, heat dumps, and uh, JMX server. Well, just calmer separated. But right now, uh, what we care about for this uh, podcast is JFR. So, yeah, you can enable other monitoring options as well. But today, we're just going to demo JFR. Um, and this other option here is basically just specifying how we want to do the method profiling. So, there's two different method prof JFR method profilers or sampler profilers um, that are implemented right now for native image. One is a recurring callback sampler, which is a little bit complicated to explain, but essentially uses uh, safe point checks as a way of counting down. So let's say we have a, a count of 10, and after we've reached 10 safe point, safe point checks, we take a sample. So there's that one, and then there's a sig prof based sampler, basically just um, uh, catches the, the sig prof signal and then takes a sample based on that. So that's, um, that's the sampler that we're using today. Um, and to specify that when we specify a quarkus.native that additional build arguments, we just enable the signal handler based um, execution sampler. So, um, and, and what, yeah. which one? Which one is is the other one the default, or do you have to specify one, or what's the? Yes, the other one is the default. That's true. Um, yeah, but I want to show, uh, I guess, like the uh, using this argument. Um, so that's why we're using the signal handler based uh, execution sample. Sure. But if you, you're right, if you don't include anything by default, it will use the the other one. Yeah. But if you want to use this okay. one, this is the argument that you'd have to pass. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, so, so basically, just you, to enable JFR, you set Quarkus native monitoring equals JFR, and then that's right. Get that's some right. Data. So, yeah. Exactly. Cool. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you don't care about the method profiler, which method profiler you're using, yeah, that's all you have to do. Just specify quarkus.native.monitoring JFR. Um, yeah, so like I said, I already uh, built to save time because it does take up a couple of minutes um, to, to build the native executable. Um, and uh, like the, um, the the regular way of doing the, the hybrid ORM, start, starting it up, you need to start a database. So this is just exactly the same as the 
as what's specified in the readme. So start the database, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, run our Quirkus native app. Oh, that's that's the same our same thing that I just showed. So to run it, it's just like running a nor normal native application. So you specify um, the binary that you want to run. And then the important part here is we specify we want to use Flight Recorder. And then uh, we specify Start rec Flight Recording and whatever JFR arguments you want to provide. So in this case, what we're providing is the file name that we want to record our uh, JFR recording to. So we're just going to call it something bland like recording.native. So um, there's that. And then another thing that is interesting here is we're providing a settings file. So a setting file is basically one way of, this is exactly the same as using J4 normally with OpenJDK in Java mode. Um, so the settings file has the same purpose here, but I'm explaining, I'm gonna explain why we're using a settings file. So what it does is it bumps up the sampling interval to uh, every one millisecond. It'll attempt to take a sample. And the reason for that is just for the sake of the demo so we can get a bunch of samples without running for multiple minutes. Um, so it bumps up the sampling interval and it also enables the object allocation um, event, so a new TLAB event. So what that'll do, it'll basically um, sample object allocations as well. And by default, that's turned off because um, if we just sample object allocations as they come, there'll be way too many allocations that'll have a ridiculous overhead um, unless you throttle it. So that's why it's turned off by default. And right now I have to turn it on uh, specifically. Uh, and that's exactly the same as in Java mode. Like, there's no difference there. Yeah. So, but before you go, I had a question here because um, you came in and said, yeah, so you added GFR as a build time, which is necessary in any image because otherwise it's not possible. Um, but how much does it add to the final build image? Do we have an uh, estimate? Like, does it make oh, it much bigger? Or, yeah. um, I don't actually know off the top of my head. But um, we can actually uh, we can actually test that right after right after this um, just by like building with and without it. Um, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. But let's come back to that right after this. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. So one thing is the size of the image. But I guess it's not going to be that much. We'll, we'll see. But otherwise, the performance overhead, I guess, I don't know, is uh, is as it is in the hotspot. Like it's a, a percent or two, or what's the what's yeah, the number it's pretty minimal. I think it's still under 2% um, for the overhead um, when you're enabling JFR. So even though you've built an instant native image, you don't necessarily have to enable it, but if you do enable it, um, yeah. Yeah, and if you don't enable it, at it's... It shouldn't have any effect not, at all. Basically, it just skips all the JFR code, yeah. Yeah. And I saw there's another one here, so it's... Jonathan says, does this enable to have breakpoints Java style and native code, or we still need DDB for that? Uh, I guess, yeah. This doesn't really have anything to do with like ability to add breakpoints. Um, this is specifically, this is just yeah. the JFR infrastructure. That would be, yeah, that would be the debugging info um, uh, implementation that's concerned with that. Yeah. And I can say, Jonathan, if I'm saying a question, yeah, JFR here doesn't touch this, but. Maybe you you the recording are catching up because we we're talking about debug too. Uh, the DDB debugging does oh sorry the debugging that is in JFR sorry D, <laughs> the debugger that is in GraalVM slash Mandel um, it works with JDB uh, but there is actually a, a, a experiment uh, that uh, where we enable the the Java debugger to be run on top of that. Um, but to answer is JFR doesn't change this, but if you want to, you can look up, uh, I'll, I'll find a link for the, for the Java style debugger for this, but, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Go, go so, ahead. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to go ahead and run it. Um, so you can see you can interact with it, um, the send points, but, um, instead of doing that, um, I actually have a hyperfoil setup, which is basically a way of kind of like, uh, stress testing something. So. Um, I basically have it set up to bombard uh, some of the, the endpoints that were spun up, um, and that'll just generate some events for us. So it's just going to put those endpoints a bunch, and then we're going to go ahead and look at the uh, output of JFR file. Okay. Um, so I've run it. 
Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and control C and stop the database, stop the Quarkus app. And um, you can see if we do LS, you can see that we have uh, recording dash native dot JFR. And if we open up Java Mission Control, we can inspect that recording um, in a convenient way. So yeah, these are the old ones. If we open it up, our file, you'll see, yeah, 930 recording dash native uh, dot JFR was created. Um, and we'll open that up. And if you go into the event browser, you can see that a whole bunch of events were uh, recorded. You can look at, for example, Java monitor weights. You can see that there's some stack traces. Um, and you can see all of the, uh, the usual event data that you'd normally see from uh, JFR in Java mode. So you can see start time, duration, end time, what event thread was emitting the events. Um, for the specific event monitor weights, you can see the monitor class. You can see the monitor address. Um, you can see whether or not the weights is turned it, out or not. Yes, yeah, so Robert, the, the resolution makes it a bit hard for us to see. So I just, oh, right. In, yeah. You say you have the, the, the start time and, and stop time. You can see those. and But in the, the flame graph below, is it showing Java classes or showing like native code? I can't actually spin it. I think it's showing Java. It's sections, seeing, right? it, it's showing, uh, uh, everything. It shows also the native code as well. So you can see actually into the substrate VM internals of uh, what the, the, the call stack is going to be. Um, I do, I can actually zoom in a little bit. I tried playing around with the text size in JDK Mission Control and found it wasn't <laughs> easy to make the text bigger. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in and I'll show you, uh, for example, what it will look like. And maybe a little bit, uh, maybe nauseating to, to see, but yeah. Um, you can see here what's going that, on. So you can see the that, monitor weight was called. Yeah, it's better. It just need, need, need a little bit of time to, to focus, but then, uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, and for example, if we look at uh, Java monitor or yeah, Java thread park, you can see some more things you can see. Uh, yeah, all this stuff here is going to be substrate VM code. And then this will be the higher level code up here. The flame graph is inverted, maybe I'll put it back to normal. So yeah, you can just see normal stack traces like you would um, in, in Java mode JFR. So yeah, here, I'm going to stop the zoom because it's a little bit hard to see stuff. Yeah, so there's that. And then I wanted to show a comparison with what you will see um, in Hotspot. So I'm going to go ahead and do the exact same thing that I did, the exact same psychic file and um, other options, but uh, with a uh, with hotspot. So, to build um, in um, in Java mode, you just uh, it's exactly the same as in the README. So I've already done that to save time. Actually, it doesn't it doesn't even take that long to build it in Java mode. So let's go ahead and build it. Okay, so then building, we have to start the database one more time. So now that's started. And then we're going to run in Java mode, exact same options. So flight recorder, start re flight recording. We're going to specify the exact same settings file. Um, this time we're going to say the recording file name is recording dash hotspot instead of recording dash native. Um, we provide the path to jar. Go ahead and run that. Cool. We can interact with it. Um, it's just a normal Quarkus quick start. Um, and we're going to run the same hyperfoil um, stress test. So run it again. Oh, it's a CPU thing. OK. Try one more time. So what, what happened? Did the test failed or? It says that the CPU uh, was used uh, for over 99%. So it's basically because I'm running too many things right now. So the test just, um, okay. yeah, it said it doesn't have to do with the Quarkus app itself. Um, it's just uh, sure. hyperfoil. Yeah. yeah. So I ran it again and it was successful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kill the uh, Quarkus app, kill the database. OK, and now we can do our comparison between native and Java mode. And I'll show you some of the quirks that are different between the two. Um, okay. 
So yeah, that's our native mode recording, still open from last time. And then we're gonna open the Java mode recording. So recording dash hotspot, uh, this was done, made at uh, 9.30 uh, AM, which is the time right now. Go ahead and open that one up. Um, yeah, so I don't really need to show you the events because this is the exact same as you would see normally with Java mode JFR, um, nothing's changed, of course. Um, but I do want to point out some differences between work uh, in native mode and Java mode. So the first thing that I want to show is uh, the method profile. So let's go to Java mode method profile. Okay, um, let's just highlight everything. Okay, I'm going to zoom in as well so you can more easily see what's going on. Um, but uh, before I do that, I just want to show you that um, right now we have 83 samples taken at uh, this uh, quarkus.run stack frame. So this is what's happening when quarkus starts up. You can see a bunch of reflection stuff is happening here as well, which is taking up uh, quite a bit of time. So we have a pretty uh, sizable amount of time spent here in the startup. Um, and now if we go to recording uh, dash native and look at method profiling, uh, yes. Highlight everything, go down here. So the same thing here is uh, happening, but none of the uh, reflection is happening here because all of those, all of that was done at build time. So all of those classes that need initialization are gonna be already initialized in the image heap. So that saves some time at build time. So in native mode, it is gonna be a little bit faster. And you can see here that only, um, that it's much smaller portion of what's going on. and. And I want to show you why, um, at least in my theory, I think this, ha this is happening. And I think the TLAB allocation gives it away. So, <clears throat> so the allocation in UTLAB is basically the event that tells you where um, allocation the allocation slow path is taking because the new TLAB is needed. Because either the previous the, the current TLAB is up, is full or the the size of the object that's being allocated is too large. The slow path has to be taken. So this takes more time. So let's go ahead and look at um, this. So in native mode, um, there isn't a whole lot of uh, slow path allocation that can be attributed to uh, um, to uh, Quarkus.run, so this, um, what's happening at startup. But um, can you guys see this OK? Uh, or is it maybe a little bit too uh, small? Zooming would be good. Zoom in, okay, yeah, zoom in. Yep. Uh, yeah, so you can see here that out of all of these, um, out of, in this flame graph, um, this the amount of TLAB events that are generated from as a result of like, stemming from the stack frame, um, which is happening at uh, startup, is quite small. Um, just visually, we can even see that. And then if we go to the Java mode recording and look at the exact same uh, flame graph. You can see that it is, we're taking a lot more samples here. So, um, and we're also getting this uh, additional, um, these additional stack frames here where we're creating some new instances. But, and I think, yeah. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is that by with DFR, you can spot that what we say that a normal Java app, uh, including quality, will spend some time initializing stuff. And in native mode, we probably just we skip all a, a lot of that. And, and we don't do the Yeah, because it's already been done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, which isn't anything surprising. This is something that um, is known. But it's something that you can inspect in maybe greater detail. and. Um, and I get to see what's, what's going on uh, more easily with JFR. Um, and this is just an example of how something might be different yeah, in native sure. versus sure. Java mode um, and why maybe you would want to use native JFR instead of Java mode because you're going to see different things. Um, okay, let me turn the zoom off and show you one final thing. So if we go into the event browser, and this is, I'm still in the, the hotspot mode. Um, data uh, and look at allocations in new T lab. 
we can see that, um, and if we filter by start time, so earliest to latest, and we just Is that really as to latest? Yeah. Oh, that was latest to earliest. My bad. So yeah, now it's chronologically sorted. Um, you can see that all of the, the T lab allocations at the very beginning of the run, or basically it's all stemming from this one stack frame um, that basically just further kind of like uh, uh, proves that point. Um, and if we go to the native mode, when I say that stack frame, I probably have to zoom in again, don't I? Um, I mean, run. So basically the whole flame graph from all of the early allocations can be attributed to this. Okay, um, zoom out again. And then if we do the exact same inspection in native mode and sort chronologically, uh, and look at just just the very beginning. Let's say this much. Um, you can see that. I'll zoom in again. You can see that a much smaller proportion is uh, can be attributed to to uh, to this Quarkus down run at startup. So, cool. Yeah, that basically just highlights some differences. You can also look at garbage collection, for example. So I'm still looking at the native mode. Uh, data, and you can see that there is only one collection. The longest pause was 5.1 uh, milliseconds. And if you look at hotspot, we're going to see some more garbage collections, of course. Um, we're going to see six GCs, so the six GC IDs. Um, and you can look at the pause times here. So, yeah, the sum of them is going to be more than than five. Yeah. So you got, that's you just got some it, differences. You got, yeah. So we got a question from. Kevin, and just I think this relates to what he just said about differences. So he's saying, is there any big difference in terms of concept of different classes on investigating a hotspot GFR compared to a native image one? Uh, um, term concept. Sorry, can you repeat the beginning of that question? I, 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 I think it's very well. At least what I'm understanding is, is there any big difference between how you use GFR, whether it's GFR or native? And my answer to that oh, is no. It's yeah, the same. Right. It's no, basically it's the same. same thing, but you'll see different behavior because native mode and Java has different runtime. Like they do different things, right? Like so, yep. that, and that's what you pointed out, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's basically correct. Uh, yeah, yeah, Max. Yeah. That's yeah. So, same same and use cases. Things, yeah. So, and, that, and that's the reason why we we spent time on getting JFR in is that you can reuse the existing knowledge you have about JFR. In JLM mode, in native mode too, but I think what maybe there might be one difference is that it, again, I'm not sure if Kevin means this by different classes, but you will see diff, like will you see different classes pop up? I assume you'll see the same classes, but they'll just have different like, be, like in Java mode, they might spend a lot of time, and in JLM, uh, native mode, they don't, uh, and by like, and it can be flipped depending on the use case. When we're talking about classes, yeah. um, it depends. So if you're if we're talking about, uh, for example, if we if we go ahead and look at, um, I think this would be a good example. If we look at uh, uh, monitor uh, Java monitor blocked, for example, um, you're going to see a lot of the same application level classes. But when you look at the the VM internals, there's going to be different classes, of course, because they're going to be substrate VM, which is what we call the runtime components in native image. They'll be substrate VM specific. So you might see classes that are specific to, uh, maybe this isn't a good example, specific to substrate VM instead, um, specifically with like, um, if you look at the stack traces, you'll see uh, various substrate VM specific classes, such as like monitor support, um, substrate VM, JVM, yeah. um, stuff like that. So yeah, the VM level stuff, you'll see different things in the stack traces, maybe in uh, the monitor class field with some, uh, synchronization based events, things like that. But for the application, yeah. uh, for your application code, the classes will just be, you know, as they are the same as in Java mode, of course. So yeah. Yeah. So I hope that answered your question, Kevin. I hope you guessed, guessed what your question was. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, that, that's the end of my okay. demo. That's all I had to show. So I'll stop sharing. Awesome. And 
so so basically um yeah so you show gfr like like a typical gfr usage right like run your application see its behavior uh run application run some tests record that with gfr and then you can go in and introspect and and uh, like you jumped around very quickly and the screen was a bit blurry <laughs> So yeah. the, for those who, those, those who don't know GFR, don't be like thrown out, out. Like once you start, once you understand what GFR does, it's like any other kind of profiling tool, met metric measuring tool. Um, and, and the nice thing is just the same can, the same tool can be used with JVM or versus native mode. So uh, that's why that's why it's good. Right. Cool. So well, I'll ask a thing. Like this was a single app. What if I have multiple applications? Get, I'm predicting what you're going to talk about next. <laughs> yeah, so we'll let Andrew uh, Andrew uh, take that segue. Yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah. let me share my screen here, and uh, um, I have some slides as well to get through quick. Um, so sure. slideshow mode, and yeah, it should be on the right one. Yeah. So the next topic then would be Cryostat. Um, so Cryostat is a container native application, like I was saying at the top. Um, that just makes it kind of friendlier to use JFR um, specifically with containers, which then obviously extends to if you're running it like, you know, Quarkus in OpenShift, you have a cluster full of lots of Quarkus applications, lots of replicas. Um, so a lot of the stuff that Robert showed is great because it lets you really dive deeply into your, um, into your application and the way it's performing. Um, but some of those pieces were a little bit maybe challenging if you're working with containers that are in a remote cluster. Um, so for example, you know, Robert showed you have to pass like the dash XX JVM flag uh, and tell JFR to start up and then tell it a file to write to. Um, and that file has to be like sort of local to your JVM process in the container. Um, so you're writing to a container file system. And so if you're not being careful, that's, you know, it's an ephemeral container storage. If you scale down or that container crashes or whatever, your JFR data is just going to get lost. Um, you can do things like attaching a persistent volume, but then you need a persistent volume claim. And so you have a claim per replica or something, and it's just overall a little bit difficult. So, and uh, since, you are saying, since you're saying all these words now with volumes and configuration and yeah. scaling, it's like, why, why aren't people just using Prometheus and Grafana? Because why, why, why? That, that seems to be yeah. a sole problem in, in that world. What, what, what the right, yeah, so so there are, you know, um, uh, parallels, I guess. Um, so Cryostat wants to kind of solve a similar case, and we actually do use Grafana too uh, in Cryostat. Um, but, you know, Cryostat is geared toward, if you want to use JFR, you want that, you know, sort of really deep uh, inspection of what the JVM is doing itself. You know, with Prometheus stuff, you can expose metrics about what your application is doing. Um, but there's a lot of internal stuff that, that JFR helps you to uh, analyze the performance of, you know, like deeper stuff within the JVM, uh, whether it's hotspot or, or substrate VM now. Um, yeah, yeah you, can, you can really get those deeper, you know, insights into, into some things that yeah. may be challenging with other solutions to get the same um, yeah. depth of yeah. uh, detail. I, uh, yeah, I, I think what's important to say is it's not an either or, right? So oh, if you have an existing, yeah. Prometheus Grafana uh, doing like let's call it traditional, or oh, not let's not call it traditional, uh, you know, cloud monitoring of your stack. That is perfect. That's valid. That's all good. And I know one of the questions we've got most of the time is like, why don't we just send all the JFR data to Prometheus? And I think yeah. the problem there is just the amount of data. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so... the, and, and and the data is not necessarily relatable like it's very low level compared to business problems um, right yeah and, and and the whole practical thing like some of the stuff you want to debug with jfr might be gone before uh, prometheus gets around to ask for it because yeah exactly it's, yeah it's, like yeah, i said right. with jfr you can see yeah. quite deeper into the stack uh, and it's true like if you're yeah. doing um so robert talked about this a bit but um the jfr file format um it is optimized to be compact. So it records in chunks. Uh, and then those chunks have, you know, like a symbol table. Um, so if you have stack frames, and you have a lot of 
um, method profiling samples that are referencing the same stack frames, they're actually just containing like a pointer to the symbol table. So it's a pretty compact format. Uh, and then even that um, binary file can be compressed further at the end. So you can contain a lot of profiling data in not as much, um, you know, like disk space, not as many bytes. Uh, whereas if you're trying to export all information and like explode it as, uh, you know, JSON or, or something, um, it's a lot more bytes to represent the same kind of information. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, there are, yeah, there's trade-offs of pros and cons. I, I don't think we're trying to say that JFR is a total replacement for every other monitoring profiling solution, um, but it is a really powerful one that, you know, should be in your toolbox, I think, along with all the rest. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, sure. so anyway, um, but JFR can be difficult. It, you know, it's a bit of an older uh, technology, I guess. It kind of predates containers becoming the dominant way to deploy um, workloads and applications. Um, a lot of, yeah, Max, you're saying, like a lot of the terms I'm using now, are, we're not talking about JFR stuff. We're talking about like Kubernetes, OpenShift, sync volumes, persistent volumes, whatever. That's, you know, OpenShift stuff. Um, but, you know, if you're deploying into these yeah. platforms, it's those are where the, the pain points yeah. kind of are between JFR yeah. and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and it might be important to note here that where Robert was mainly focused on, hey, here are the things that JFR can also do in or work with in native mode. What you talk about here is applicable for both native JFR and yeah, yeah, JVM exactly. JFR, right? Yep. It's, yeah, it's, so I'm going to highlight so, afterward how you can actually yeah. use Cryostat for both, too. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Cool. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so then, so what specifically is Cryostat? Um, so it is a container application. Actually, it's a couple of different containers that are, you know, related to each other. It's got a little bit of a, you know, microservice, I guess, architecture. Um, a couple of those containers are actually built with Quarkus. Not all of them yet, but we're moving in that direction. Um, and yeah, it, it lets you um, do things, you know, in a sort of cloud native way. So it takes away some of that pain of configuring volumes and, and whatever else. Um, and we, the point here about being more secure is this is relating to the idea of, you know, if you're having to expose JMX um, to do things dynamically, which is an option now in Cryostat, you don't have to do that. But if you were to expose JMX, um, you'd probably rather expose JMX just within your cluster or within your namespace um, rather than having to expose it to, you know, the outside world traffic and then have JMX open on your application and connect to it from JMC on your laptop, um, J uh, JDK mission control on your laptop, you know, from outside the cluster. You have a JMX port then wide open to the internet. <laughs> uh, better to keep that JMX port. If it's going to be open at all, it better be open only to traffic in the cluster and then talk to Cryostat, which has a much more locked down uh, interface than JMX. Uh, and then kind of, you know, it acts as like a bridge and proxy kind of thing. Um, and then Cryostat also has other features to just make JFR um, stuff, like we have automation and we have some online analysis things you can do too, uh, which I'll get into with the demo. Um, yeah, so, you know, it helps by, like I said, it, it helps to um, um, uh, smooth out the pain of trying to configure storage. Uh, it does that for you. Uh, and then we have the online analysis. We, we do use Grafana. Um, for certain things you can see. Um, you can still also just download the JFR file to your workstation straight from Cryostat. So if you do want to open it up in JDK Mission Control and do all the same kind of analysis that Robert was showing you, um, it enables you to do that pretty smoothly. Um, and then of course, we've been saying JDK Flight Recorder because uh, it's not just for Java. If you're writing in like Scala or some other JVM language, then you have access to JFR and therefore you can also use Cryostat too. Um, so yeah, I have a, a quick demo to share. Um, so let me share uh, next thing, share screen, uh, and I'll share this next window. Um, okay, so you're seeing um, a graph, hopefully. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I can try to zoom this in a bit. Okay. Um, so what we're looking at here, I'll zoom this back out a little bit so I can show the overview. Um, this is the, it's the topology view of Cryostat. So Cryostat has a, a couple of different mechanisms that you can use so that it knows where your applications are uh, on, you know, sort of deployment scenario. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about what these different things are, but basically I have a, a, a Docker Compose file here with uh, 
one of the native mode uh, application that I built, the same one that Robert showed you before with the, you know, enabling JFR and JMX in the uh, build time. Uh, and then one that's just a plain, same quick start in JVM mode. So they're both the same application, um, you know, built slightly different and then both packaged into containers pretty much the same way with Docker files. Um, all that stuff is pretty much just, you know, plain hibernate ORM quick start from uh, Quarkus quick starts. Um, so yeah, we have them running um, and I can see if I uh, go look at some of these. So here we have, um, here we have a Quarkus JVM and here we have a Quarkus native. So these are our two applications that are the, the quick start ones that we're interested in. Um, and so if I pick one of these guys, I can go and I can see some stuff about them. Um, so maybe we want to see the event types that are implemented. So these are all the JFR event types that are, uh, if I were to monitor these applications, these are the kinds of data points that I can collect. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of the stuff that Robert talked about. We have the TLAB events, we have monitor events, things like that. And we can compare that to what we have for the native. So this uh, drop down is kind of just a list view of that topology we saw before. Um, so the native one we can compare, and we can see also we have TLAB. You know, we have monitor. We have a lot of the same stuff. So, so Andrew, just because this looks very much like the OpenShift console, but it's it's not right. This is like a separate. Correct. Yeah, yeah. This is a full set application. Yes. It's CryoSite uh, console. It, it is built with Patternfly, so it looks just like OpenShift basically. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, this is a separate application that you know. It, this is the CryoSat web uh, web front end. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, on that note, we do have an OpenShift operator. So if you want to, if you're deploying your Quarkus to OpenShift and you want to use CryoSat, um, I'm not doing that in this demo just to keep it simple. It's a Docker Compose file, but we have an operator and also a Helm chart. Um, so if you want to deploy to OpenShift or other Kubernetes, then you can get CryoSat running beside your applications. Um, you know, pretty easily, pretty low friction. Um, yeah, so there's all these different kinds of events. Um, Robert was talking about those event settings files. Um, so we can see them graphically here. Um, and these are, uh, I should have had a terminal open, but if you look in your um, JDK distribution, you'll see these like .jfc um, files. They're really XML files that just describe how to set up, you know, the settings you're going to use for uh, for flight recordings. Um, so you can see which ones are available. You can also download um, those files to your workstation. And then if you open them, um, they're, they're just, like I said, XML. Um, it's not a super complicated format, so you can do things with these. Uh, let me actually open that with an editor quickly. Um, and uh, well, I think you probably can't see what I'm doing right now, right? But um, I'm going to make some quick changes. Um, I'm just editing the XML file. It's, it's nothing too exciting. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to make a couple really minor edits and, uh, and then get back to my browser where you can see, see me do something more interesting with it. Um, OK, so there's that. And go back here. So if I hit this um, you know, uh, machine upward <laughs> upload button, um, I can actually upload um, uh, file. So I just downloaded the profiling file that I showed you, quickly edited it, um, and I can open it and submit. And so that template has been created, and we see it now here. Um, it's actually just a copy of this exact one. I didn't actually change any settings, but I can go in and I can change which events are enabled, how often, like sampling based ones, how often they sample. Um, we, there's a lot of controls that JFR has for like thresholds and things like that that you can control too. Um, that's a little out of scope of this demo, so I, I don't want to go into all that. Um, but you can create your own customized templates. Uh, and then that template is available for any of your applications. Um, so you can pick whichever ones. Um, and you know that, that one is, um, sorry, this one is still uh, there for all of them. Um, so you can use that across whichever. Uh, and once you've defined one, or if you want to use one of your pre-existing ones that's shipped with your JDK, um, so you can go ahead and manually create a recording. So I'll just name it something. Um, because I started from that view, it, you know, it's pre-populated with this template. Um, there's advanced options that you probably don't need to change. Just leave them as they are. And then you can do things like add labels. Um, these are just for display to help you figure out, you know, why did I do this? <laughs> what was the point of what was I trying to gather here or something for sorting later? Um, yeah, so you can go ahead and create that. 
and then I can go to the recordings view and I can see it. I can see the start time, um, both localized and, you know, in, uh, UTC time. Uh, I can see my labels. Um, you can filter by labels and things too. There's lots of controls here. Um, so if you have a lot of recordings, you can see them all. And uh, I set it to run for 30 seconds. So I'll let that clock run down just a little bit more. Um, but whether your recording is active here, which means that currently this data only lives, uh, there it is, only lives in that JVM process, uh, whether it's native or JVM mode. Um, once it's been archived, now it's been copied to storage that Cryosat manages. So if this application were to crash or I scale it down or something happens to it, um, I actually still can access that data um, later. So it's preserved and now I can you know, perform analysis, even if that application is offline or whatever happened to it. Uh, and just to, to understand, so this uh, applying the what you call the profile and turn on and off that yep. works equally, 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 equally well for a native yes. one. Yeah. Or non -native? Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, oh, I actually had the wrong. So that was Cryoset itself, which is a JVM application. Um, but I can pick the native one and I can do the same thing. I can hit the hello world, create recording. S2, oops, um, create, and it, it's working. It's, it's doing the same thing. Uh, and when this is done, uh, because I have this box archive on stop checked, it'll automatically copy that buffer into the storage that CrossSat manages. Um, so it'll be done yeah. automatically. Um, if you want to do things more freeform, you have that option too. So I can say, um, you know, ongoing, whatever, um, continuous duration. So it won't automatically stop. You know, we have helper text to explain things to you. Um, I can pick the continuous template. So this is meant to be, it doesn't capture as much data. It's meant for continuous monitoring. Um, so I can hit that and now we see it's continuous. This will just run forever uh, until I either stop it or the application crashes, something like that. Um, but if I want to take sort of a snapshot of it, I can select it and hit archive and now it's copied as well. Um, so I have that data preserved. Um, Very cool. Yeah. And, and so from there I can go ahead, I can, I can download those. So now there it is. Now it's on my workstation. I can open this with JDK Mission Control. Um, I'll skip doing that for sake of time, but that's the same thing that <laughs> what uh, Robert was showing you before. Um, you can do all kinds of analysis on that. Um, yeah, so you, there's, there's, not a in, there's not an embedded view. It's You, you take the sample file, download it, and then you do it locally on your... Correct, yeah. So <laughs> when you do that step that I just did, you're going to copy that data out of your OpenShift cluster or wherever your applications in Cryosat are running and it's going to you know, get copied onto your workstation, and then now you can open it in JMC there. Um, if you don't want to do that, we don't have a full implementation of everything JMC does, because it does a lot. And it's an old <laughs> application with a lot of developer hours put into it. Um, but we do some stuff. So you have here an action you can do uh, on these archived or on active recordings, either way. Um, so we have view in Grafana. And, uh, this is not very interesting. I didn't really do anything to the application as it was running. So um, you're not really seeing metrics here. Maybe if I open the, a recording from Cryoset itself, maybe we'll have something interesting um, since it was actually doing a couple of things. Yeah, so, uh, so we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see your screen, uh, Andrew. You just oh, see the- Oh, it's a long tab. Yeah, yeah. The... I need to share this yeah. tab instead. Okay, so, so now you should see a Grafana uh, view. Um, yeah, and so you know, there's, we have a lot of these panels um, for, for various different kinds of metrics. Um, obviously, some of these won't make any sense. They'll have just like no data available, like compiler stuff. Uh, if you're running, if you're um, profiling a native image, um, some of these just again, like Robert was saying before, they just aren't applicable. Um, but a lot of stuff is. So you can, you know, you can it's regular Grafana stuff. You can zoom in and see a lot of details about what exactly was going on. Um, you know based on the data available in your JFR recording. Um, so this network yeah, nice. utilization is, you know, that's me clicking around, talking to Cryosat, downloading recordings and things. You can see the network utilization that I'm asking it to do. Sure. Cool. Um, yeah, we can see all kinds of samples. Um, this one even has a little separate dashboard we can open up. I'll need to share this tab instead again. And I, yeah, this is not a super interesting um, data set, but, you know, we can see samples of all kinds of different um, types, you know, classes um, over time when they're being allocated. Um, so you might be able to find, you know, hot allocations happening, a lot of things, and see correlations and things with this too. 
Um, right yeah, nice. so that, that's the, um, the the quick one that we have for, you know, if you don't want to have to export to JMC, you might be able to see what you're looking for just by doing this. Uh, this workflow, all of your data has stayed in your cluster. It never left, you know, whatever premises the cluster is deployed on. Um, so that can be just kind of kept, you know, nice and secure um, behind your firewall rules and things. Uh, we do have one more thing I want to show. So if we hop back to the cryostat UI, um, we do have some tools for uh, for monitoring. So the idea is that, you know, how do you know that you want to start profiling your application? Like, how do you know that there's something to look at? <laughs> Interesting data to be found. Um, these charts don't look great. Let me put this in light view. Uh, we do have a cryostat light view, I guess. <laughs> um, so you can see, you know, we have these Charts, um, these are pulling over JMX. They're talking to like your operating system, MX Bean and things like that. So currently um, those don't actually do anything for native mode. I think that's being worked on, um, but they do work for JVM at least. Um, but we have other kinds of content we can put on this dashboard. So, uh, so what I'll do is I'll create a new layout and I can add new stuff to this uh, layout. Um, so I can add, let's say this guy, this target JVM details. Um, so this gives me a nice card with just an overview of basic data. Uh, we saw this same component over here. This is the same thing, just extracted to a bigger, uh, you know, a bigger viewport, I guess. So that's the thing. Um, so we can see various things uh, about the application. Uh, we can see, you know, what JVM version it's running on, who built it, um, the kernel version that the container has, things like that. Um, native mode, you know, some of this is not implemented because it's over JMX. Hopefully, one day soon, we'll have this similar information for this, too. Uh, right now, it, you'll just get, you know, unknown, whatever. Yeah. I think they have it in, in Graven 23, right? That's where they added the, the DMX stuff? Um, there, yeah, there's some, like, JMX is there, but not every MX bean is implemented, or not all the methods return, you know, sure. same information. So um, it's, it's, you know, generally broadly there, but it's not fully at par. Uh, not yet, anyway. Yeah, um, that's right, good. basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll, this one's kind of whatever. Well, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, and we'll show one more quick. We have automated analysis. This one's for sure the most interesting one on this view. Um, so I can go ahead and create this other card. And I can also, by the way, like I showed before, I can resize. You can drag and drop um, positions of these guys if you want to put charts um, for whatever, you know, I can say, uh, I, I want this to refresh more often or, or things. And you have, these are from JMX. So these are JMX and bean metrics. So, um, I can put, um, I don't know, heap usage, let's say, uh, in, uh, in gold. Uh, and then now we have that chart. Um, it'll take it, you know, some time to gather samples and, um, show anything interesting, but it will, um, Again, not on the native one, but it will on the JVM one. Um, so this this card is saying we don't have any automated uh, analysis because there's no recordings available. So I can just go ahead and quickly hit create recording. It'll do it for me. Uh, it creates a recording and does some analysis, uh, you know, within Cryostat um, to tell me what's going on with this application. Um, and so green. Um, this is a thing that was brought to our attention. This is not uh, colorblind friendly, so that's on a roadmap to fix this. So you can <laughs> um, you can tell better. Um, you can choose different palettes or whatever. But anyway, green is uh, it looks okay. So there's just uh, there are scores here that tell you um, so zero means like it was able to analyze this um, uh, this this rule, um, and uh, you know no problems seem to be there. Uh, here we have a low score, so. We did some analysis. We saw something in this category, but it was not really of concern. Um, red is like something is bad. So this is a, a test setup. <laughs> we do have a password and environment variable. So it's telling me, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, you know, you probably want to mount this as a secret or something, not put it into an environment variable. Um, and you can filter these by severity and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and there's a list view instead. Um, yes. Yeah, so so this is meant to show, you know, you can take a quick glimpse and say, okay, how are my applications doing? Um, compare different ones. So you can compare your native to your uh, uh, JVM mode by just doing this and switching back and forth um, and look at, you know, what's okay, what's not okay, and then 
something here might stick out and you say, oh, well, there's a lot of profiling. The score is not zero. Something bad is happening. And then you can jump into profiling and figure out what exactly is actually happening. Very cool. So uh, we, uh, you got more across that? Because we actually... Uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're kind of over time. I just wanted to briefly mention something quick. Um, so that was all based on JMX. There is also a cryostat agent. Um, so here we have the JVM mode guy. He's got the cryostat agent attached. Um, that's why he's off separate on his own. Um, the cryostat agent lets you do stuff that's read only. So you can, using the uh, HTTP connection here. Um, oh, he's not showing up. There's a bug in the demo. Um, there's a different one anyway. So you can see some stuff. Uh, you can get the read-only data, um, including uh, this chart will populate. What we can't do is any dynamic creation stuff. Um, right now, that's intentional. Um, we want to expand that to also be dynamic and rewrite. Uh, so you can do things like starting JFR uh, over this HTTP connection instead of JMX. Again, just for security, it's more locked down. JMX can do a lot of a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, and it's yeah. understandable to have hesitation to expose JMX. Um, so yeah, we're working on that, but there is an agent that you can use um, to help discover your applications and pull some metrics. You can also configure the agent to push JFR files on a schedule. So instead of having to pull over JMX, you can push over HTTP into cross that storage. Um, yeah, that was, that was the last thing I wanted to say. Awesome, cool. And we had we had a few uh, not hangovers, what's called left, leftovers. Um, we had Kevin asking about uh, the image size. So while you were doing cryostats, Robert showed that uh, with JFR it was seventy nine point two max. With ORM, sorry, without JFR it was seventy six point six. Um, so it's like I don't know, two or three max of overhead. Um, so it, it is a difference, but it's a very small difference. Um, so, so that's expected. So I, I would say most people who are doing native, it sounds like you're getting to a point where having the JFR is probably recommended just to be able to do this for your for your production uh, loads. Um, because if you don't enable it when you run, then there's no overhead, but you can always split, switch, switch it on. So <clears throat> that's a good one. Uh, and we have one more about Mandrel, but before I do that, anything else you guys want to co cover uh, on the phone? Like, where can you find more? Code? Oh, you had that in the slide decks. We'll put those in the show notes. Um, yeah. Anything else before I take the last question about Mandrel? I think we're good. Yeah, not for me. Yeah. You can go ahead and take it. Okay. Yeah. So let me find it again. Um, this is also Kevin. Kevin held a good question today. Oh, Yoko was good too. Hey, so Kevin asks, like, any hints on what is the future of Mandel since GraalVM joined OpenDK recently? Um, so the future is bright. Uh, uh, let me tell you why. So first of all, GraalVM hasn't joined OpenDK yet. Uh, what has happened is that there is a part of Graal, uh, and I forgot the name. Uh, the, there's a product in OpenDK where piece, pieces of GraalVM is moving in. Uh, uh, which Galahad. Name. Galahad. Galahad, that was yeah. the name. Um, but it's not. There's nothing uh, concrete. It's not. Doesn't exist yet. In, in well, it's not a. It's not part of JDK yet. <clears throat> so, what people might not realize what Mandel is. Mandel is actually not a Red Hat product or project. It's a GraalVM project, and the difference between GraalVM Mandel and and GraalVM is that Mandel is built on a stock JDK, right? So that was one of the, uh, in Red Hat we were not fond of the idea of using uh, using native image on what's called the Oracle Labs ADK because the only reason that exists is for all the, the MOOC polyclot uh, and a few other features. And we don't need, we, that's not for native image, that's not a goal for us. So we wanted a, a clean separate status and on the ADK. Um, and then on top of that, it's also an alternative distribution of GraalVM. And until now, that, would, that might seem like unnecessary noise or, or by some. Uh, for us, it's important because it was a build that we could put on, on that could be an OMDK. But now where GraalVM is going into the AK, 
And especially here with GraalVM23, what you'll see is that uh, it, it's not part of OBK yet, and it's probably going to take years before that happens. But GraalVM, uh, or Oracle rather, they now they announced that their Oracle GraalVM will became, become uh, available on a license so you can try it out in production. Um, whereas the GraalVM, so that, and the GraalVM community will still exist. <clears throat> but it will always upgrade to the latest version of JDK. So this is part of the whole transition. The, the Graalvium is also going to move to this very, like, every six months cadence. So the Graalvium community will be the latest, greatest all the time. Again, this is good. This is a, a good story. But we are then missing a free, on free as in free as in beer, free as in speech, open source uh, distribution. And that's where Mandel comes in. Uh, Mandel is still based on OBK, still based on the Graalvium community, and there's a community distribution of GraalVM, and there's the Red Hat build uh, distribution of, of, of Mandel. Um, and so that's why I'm saying Gra uh, Mandel is still very important, is because that is the, 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 the free version that's going to be around and maintained for older versions of Java. Uh, how far back we will do it, it's still up in the air, but it's going to be a longer period than, than the Graalvium community is. Uh, so, yeah, long story short to say that uh, what's happening is that Graalvium is moving more over to how OpenDK operates, where there's OpenDK, the open source product that takes the late, follows the very latest, greatest. And then there's multiple distributions, including Oracle's own, that has uh, available on a different licenses, different uh, support, that kind of thing. And one of those is uh, Red Hat and Adoption, for example, which are is similar to what Mantle is, but just for program in that sense. So I hope that explained a bit why Mantle is still important and probably more important than it was before, because it becomes a distribution that you can use uh, for free, both in speech and in, in beer. So. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope so. Um, but yeah, I think that was all the questions we got. And, uh, you know, thank you, Robert and Andrew. And uh, I'm definitely going to try out the the, the DAFR. I, I keep forgetting that it's there. <laughs> but uh, now I've seen that, you know, and rem remind me again, it's actually easy to enable in native image. And I actually... I hadn't thought about it, but the fact that you can actually compare the native with the Java version in a very easy way, it's actually a, it's a good reason to actually have it there. Um, so cool. I would, on Cryostat, this is the thing. I think people, uh, how long I Cryostat? Is that like two years now? I feel like it's longer. Um, three? I think the first commit I ever did to Cryostat was like three years ago. Ish, I can pull yeah. my kit log really quickly, but yeah, it's oh, a fairly oh, young it, project. Yeah, um, but, initial commit I, I January 2019, so four years ago. Okay, so yeah, so it's, it's for you, but hey, the, the point is that uh, JFR independent of native and stuff, like we've made it so it works both places. I mean, Christ, that even you hear, like, I know a feedback generally been, oh, it's too hard to manage in the cloud, that's what Christ that is trying to help with. And uh, so if you haven't tried it, try it out. It's called Cryostat. It can be installed in OpenShift and other community distributions. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. But Robert, Andrew, thank you for staying around. And uh, thank you for the demo. So Great. Thanks, thanks for having us on the podcast. Yeah.